In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Father, as we enter into this Holy Week, we ask that your Spirit might be moving deeply in our hearts, giving us the grace that we need to be docile to the movements of his love, sensitive to the work of salvation and redemption that's been wrought for us, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, his glorious resurrection. Lord, we know that these days have prepared for us so much of your goodness and love and grace. Ask that you would give us tonight to open our eyes to taste and see the goodness of the Lord, to become more aware and more sensitive, and through that to be transformed. Bless all of us gathered tonight, Lord. Whatever thoughts and whatever questions in our hearts, help us, Lord, to see you through the things that we learn and the liturgies that we encounter. And Mary, pray with us, pray in us. You walked with Jesus to the end. Help us to do the same. And so we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. Have a seat. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so excited. I hope that you'll take some really good stuff from our presentation tonight. Um, I've been doing this the last couple years, <coughs> excuse me, offering this Holy Week 101 session. Um, part of it is because I... I, I think you probably picked this up when you were here at Mass this weekend, but I really, really love the Triduum, right? And the Triduum, by the way, if you're brand new at some of this, you might say, oh, that's a funny word, right? Why don't you say it with me? Triduum. Spelled T-R-I-D-U-U-M. Triduum. Say that. Triduum. And Triduum is just the, the Latin word for three days, right? The great three days. And it's meant to help us to celebrate Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday. That's referred to as the Triduum, right? Um, the most sacred celebrations in our church year. Um, every year that we come to them, you see just the richness of our Catholic faith on full display. Um, but the problem with richness is if you don't know how to read it and you don't know how to understand it, you miss it. And so that's the goal of tonight is just to give you some some keys, maybe some, uh, a new pair of glasses to be able to understand what is it that we're actually doing and why is this stuff so cool and why is it so powerful. Um, as we're talking about the Triduum tonight, I'm aiming to go about an hour and a half total. Um, that gives me some time to talk about Holy Thursday, some time to talk about Good Friday, and some time to talk about Holy Saturday. If we hit the hour and a half mark and we're not quite there yet, um, I'll give you a blessing, and those that want to stick around and answer questions, we can still do that. So, but that's my plan for tonight, um, just to give you, again, a little bit of an orientation into each of those days. Now, one of the things that um, I think is really helpful to understand, so the church's way of celebrating, when I talk about the church, I'm talking about the universal Catholic church, right? This is the, the theology of how we understand these celebrations. The church's way of celebrating the Triduum really is not to understand it as three separate days, but is really as if it was one really, really, really long day, right? Um, you remember, we've talked about it in Mass at various points, um, but as Catholics, we understand our memorials and we understand our liturgies and we understand our celebrations not as being something that kind of helps us to remember the past as if it was just like an anniversary, like, hey, we're celebrating the anniversary of Jesus' death, right? We're going to come upon this in just a moment, but we celebrate these as mysteries, as memorials, right? Um, but we touch back into the ancient Jewish sense of a memorial, and a memorial isn't just a, a remembrance of a past action, but the, the Jewish sense of a memorial is a making present of a past action, 
right? So what God did in the past, he's now doing for us during these days. In fact, the best way for you to understand our liturgical practices within the Catholic Church, anything that has to do with Mass and has to do with prayers that we do as Catholics, the best way for you to understand it is that Jesus takes everything that he did for us in the past, and now he applies it to you, right? It's as if all of that grace was coming to bear upon you. You go to Mass because that's Jesus using what he accomplished on the cross, but now to save you. He's incorporating you into these mysteries, right? He's helping to welcome you to the table of his mercy. Because otherwise you're just talking about anniversaries, right? Wasn't it nice that Jesus died for us 2,000 years ago? Well, I, yes, I guess. But then how does that have any effect upon you, right? The power of the, the liturgy, the gift that the Lord has given, and he gave it to us, by the way, from the very beginning. That's what we're going to hit on as soon as we open and turn the slide to Holy Thursday, right? The power of what Jesus has given to us in the liturgy, in the Eucharist, in the Last Supper, is that he's constantly swearing himself to be present with us until the end of the age. And so as we enter into the, the liturgical celebrations of Holy Thursday and Good Friday and Holy Saturday, the Triduum, realize what's happening is all of these things that we're hearing about, all of these things that we're calling to mind, again, we're not just celebrating an anniversary, they're coming to bear now. Sometimes uh, my, my favorite kind of image would be that you would jump into a time machine, right? And you're going back 2,000 years to sit with Jesus at the Last Supper, at the table of his love, to be present there at the foot of the cross with Mary and Mary Magdalene and St. John, to be drawn into the silence of the empty tomb. Excuse me, the, the, not the empty tomb, the tomb that contains the dead Christ, right? And to be absolutely catapulted into exhilarating joy at the glorious resurrection of our Lord and those first appearances of your friend who died and is now back to life. So let's jump in and let's see if we can kind of decode some of these celebrations that we have. Our first liturgy, the first major thing that begins the Triduum is the uh, Mass of the Lord's Supper that happens on Holy Thursday night. Um, the Mass of the Lord's Supper, of course, is the commemoration of the, the Jesus gathering with his apostles for the last time before his passion and death, right? We say oftentimes that he instituted the Eucharist at the Last Supper, right? As you're listening to the accounts in the scriptures, take this all of you and eat of it. This is my body. This is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And wouldn't you know it? That's kind of what we do, isn't it? Right? When people are like, man, I don't understand. Why do I have to go to Mass? It doesn't seem all that important. Well, with all due respect, if you're going to tell me it's not all that important, then what you're going to tell me is what Jesus says just isn't all that important to you. Right? Because the thing is pretty clear. Do this in remembrance of me. And so that's what we do. Why do you go to Mass? Because Jesus told you to. That's the, the flat out best answer, the easiest way to say it. Right? Why do you go to Mass? Because Jesus told you to. He told you that's what he wanted. He said, this is the way I want to be worshipped. Do this in remembrance of me. Right? He also institutes at that celebration, at the Last Supper, the priesthood. Right? How is he going to continue this move of offering his body and his blood, soul and divinity, consecrating bread and wine and changing it into his body and blood? Well, what he does is he associates and affiliates to himself the twelve apostles and gives them this incredible gift and this incredible charism to be able to offer their lives in service to himself and to the church and also to make holy God's people, right? Priests are given the, the grace, the gift to sanctify, to make things holy. Um, so those are the major things that we're celebrating at Holy Thursday, right? The institution of the Eucharist, the institution of the priesthood. Um, beautiful, beautiful uh, mysteries to reflect upon. Let me take you through a little bit of the, uh, the celebration itself. The key features, the things that look different at a Mass of the Lord's Supper. Um, of course, you may notice, you may know this, but that's the, the um, washing of the apostles' feet, right? So at the Last Supper, excuse me, yes, at the Last Supper, oh man, could you run and grab me a Bible? Because um, that's what I meant, I forgot to grab that. 
But at the Last Supper, when Jesus is gathered together with his apostles, right, um, one of the things that he does is he takes a, a towel and wraps it around his waist and gets down on one knee and begins to, to wash their feet. And you remember what he says to them at that time, right? Peter and the others freak out. They're like, well, wait a second. You can't wash my feet. I ought to be washing your feet. They know Jesus is the Lord of heaven and earth. He's God made man, right? And so they're like, I don't, I don't deserve this, right? Could you imagine just for a second if the, the most important person to you or the most famous person to you or the person that, that has the most significance to you got down on one foot, one knee and began to wash your feet? It was a servant's task in Jesus' day, right? And think about this because, right, what was the, the common footwear in Jesus' time? Yeah, right? And um, last time I checked, but in the first century, um, the roads there were definitely not paved, right? So um, I just came back from Honduras. My um, shoes are actually cleaned up quite a bit since then, but day one on my way back from Honduras, these things were covered in dust, right? You can still see a little bit dustiness. They're not nice, sharp black. They're, they're really kind of well, dusty, <laughs> right? They're dirty. And um, so the fact that Jesus, in, in all of his generous love, would get down on one knee and, and begin to bathe the, the disciples' feet, wash them off, right? That was meant to be, like I said, a servant's task, right? Peter freaks out. But here's the thing I want you to notice, right? Throughout the course of our celebrations, from the Last Supper all the way to the cross and all the way to the silence of the tomb, right? There's this one move that you'll start to see all the way through, and it's Jesus' self-emptying love. His self-emptying love. Um, by the way, we, we have a, a, a word in Greek that we use to remember that. It's called kenosis. Can you say that? Kenosis. Kenosis, kenosis is just the self-emptying love of Christ, right? It's what we heard actually this last weekend at the Palm Sunday readings, right? That second reading is one of my all-time favorites. It comes from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. He says, Christ, being in the form of God, didn't deem equality with God something to be grasped at, but rather... He emptied himself, taking upon himself the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men. He came to us in human estate, and it was thus that he humbled himself, obediently accepting even death, St. Paul says, death on a cross, right? So you think about this for a second, right? Put yourself in, in the divine kind of calculation of things, right? God is infinitely glorious, infinitely great, infinitely amazing, infinitely powerful, right? And what does he do? He limits himself. He enters into our weak and fragile humanity, right? But that's not enough. As he's going down, he goes down not even to, to just like a, a king or to some royal ruler or something like that. No, he enters into a, a peasant's life, right? Presents himself before his apostles, not as one to be served, but one to serve, to give himself as a ransom for many. He takes a towel and he gets down on one knee and begins, I mean, he's getting closer and closer and closer to the floor, right? As you continue to look at the moves of Holy Week and you go into the gestures from Good Friday, we're going to go, in, excuse me, from Holy Thursday, we're going to go into Good Friday. Jesus is going to literally be crushed under the weight of the cross and the weight of the sins of the world. He goes down all the way even to the darkest depths of God forsakenness as he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Apostles' Creed tells us not only does he die on the cross, he descends to hell, Right? as far away from God as he could possibly get, right? Literal, total, and complete self-empty. Kenosis. That's the move of these three days, right? It's taking us, that it's taking us into Jesus' move of perfect love that goes all the way for you and for me. At the end of the uh, Holy Thursday Mass, one of the other beautiful features is we have a, a little procession with the, the Eucharist, right? Um, we'll walk from here, we'll walk through the church and take the Blessed Sacrament to an altar of repose. You remember after Jesus ate uh, the Last Supper with his apostles, do you remember where he goes? He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, right? And as he's there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying deeply, fervently for you and for me asking the Lord in his, in his providence and his mercy to deliver him from that hour, right? God, Father, if it's possible, let this chalice pass by without my drinking it. 
but not my will, but yours be done, right? And so the move of the, the procession in the church is essentially following Jesus into that garden of repose, into that, that moment of Gethsemane. And we'll talk about in just a second why that's so significant. Now, let me tell you this. Holy Thursday is meant to be a, a joyful celebration, right? It's powerful. It's beautiful. It's triumphal, right? Um, it's not quite the joy of Easter. You'll notice the decorations are going to change from purple to white, right? White is always a celebratory color in the Catholic Church. It's meant to call our minds to the, the light of the resurrection, right? Um, but you'll notice the colors will change to white on Thursday. God bless Barb and her decorating team because Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, they're doing costume changes for the church every single day. So pray for them. They got a lot of work to do, right? But the decorations will change to white. The mass itself starts out with a, an, a, a cry of victory, right? Um, we say, let us always glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our salvation, our life, and our resurrection. In him we're saved and set free. We know what's coming, right? Side note, Jesus also knows what's coming. Jesus knows what's coming. But at the same time, what does he say? He says, I've earnestly desired to share this Passover with you. I long to eat this meal with you. I want to give myself for you. And because of that, like I said, the tone of Holy Thursday is actually quite joyful. It's actually quite celebratory. In fact, we'll sing the Gloria at the Holy Thursday Mass. Remember the Gloria, right? Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to people of goodwill. That's the hymn that the angels and the saints sung at the moment of Jesus' birth, right? We sing it at every single Sunday Mass. As a matter of fact, it's one of the things that sets the Sunday Masses apart from daily Masses, right? You come to daily Mass, and daily Mass is like half the length of a Sunday Mass. And that's just because I talk less at a daily Mass, <laughs> though I do, right? But it's, um, it's, it's half the length because there's all these little parts that are missing. Why are they missing? Because we want to give that sense of joy and triumph and celebration to our Sunday liturgies, right? That's not something I made up, by the way. That's just the church's rubrics. That's how the church asks us to celebrate Mass, right? But we've not sung the Gloria throughout Lent. And we've not sung the Gloria throughout Lent because we know that Lent is a penitential season. It's a time to turn back to the Lord, to say, I've sinned. I, I've broken that relationship, that friendship, that covenant with you, right? But Holy Thursday, again, carries the weight of celebration. It's a joyful beautiful mass and so we sing the gloria for the first time in what's been basically six weeks right and to draw some attention to it one of the things that we do we ring the bells for the mass like crazy right god bless my altar servers because they're going to start at the beginning of the gloria glory to god in the highest Glo uh, i'm sorry what, which one do we sing yeah gloria a dios en el cielo y en la tierra paz a los hombres que aman señor glory to god in the highest Glory to God, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. For Clemenza Gloria te alabamos. And the kids are super cute because, like, they start out and they're super enthusiastic and they're like, yeah, yeah, we're ringing the bells, we're ringing the bells. But they forget that that song goes on for like six minutes. And <laughs> this gets to be really, really tiresome after about six minutes of ringing it, right? Um, but as they keep singing, uh, they'll do that. And again, what's the purpose of bells in the Mass? The purpose of bells is to say, pay attention. This is important. This is significant. This is joyful. It's good. God has done something. He's doing something. And we, <coughs> excuse me, we know that during these days, he's going to be giving us the, the, the graces of the mysteries of our salvation. Of course he's doing something. So yeah, ring those bells and do it like crazy, right? As a matter of fact, if you want to bring a bell from home and you want to ring with them, feel free to. I'm happy to. You've got kids? Feel free to tell your kids to bring a bell from home. It's going to be fun, right? We go, yeah! They'll get tired, but it'll be cool. But it's interesting. As soon as, because again, yes, the mess begins in triumph, but you know where this is going, right? Jesus finishes the Last Supper, and, and very, very quickly after that, is going to be betrayed by one of his best friends, ultimately denied by his other best friend, handed over into the hands of sinful men, and crucified and died for us, right? So as soon as the uh, Gloria ends, the bells actually go silent. And they won't be used again for the next couple days. 
until we ring them again at the Easter Vigil, right? At the first celebration of the Lord's resurrection. mentioned some of this, the, like I said, the liturgy of uh, the Triduum is one long liturgical day. In fact, we start the Holy Thursday Mass with the sign of the cross, and I don't say the Mass is ended in peace until the end of the Easter Vigil on Holy Saturday night. Think about that for a second, right? The, the Holy Thursday Mass will depart in silence after we've accompanied the Lord for a few moments in, uh, in the altar of repose. Good Friday, you'll come here. I'll, I'll give you a blessing at the conclusion of that celebration, and then I'll just walk out. It's actually super awkward, right? Because you're like, oh, what do I do? Right? Because you're not used to that. I'll just walk. I'll, I'll leave. And you'll be like, did he forget something? No, I didn't forget something. And even at the beginning of the Holy Saturday Mass, I don't start again with the sign of the cross. We're still in the middle of one long liturgical day, right? Which, side note, is one of the reasons why I encourage you, if you can, to be present for all three of those celebrations, right? Sometimes it's easy, my, God bless my mom, she's gonna get mad that I told you this, but my mom loves Holy Thursday, comes to Holy Thursday every year, actually loves Good Friday as well, but she says pretty frequently, nah, the Easter Vigil's too long, I'm not going. Your father won't be into it, I love that, she blames it on dad, right? Your father won't be into it, so, um, but you're, you're missing out, right? You're, that would be like going to two thirds of your Sunday Mass and then like somewhere around the Our Father being like, yep, I'm done, too much. Right? Okay, well, you kind of missed the most important part, right? So um, think of it as one long liturgical day. Um, you might have heard the, the phrase Maundy Thursday before. Anybody ever heard of that or heard that? Sometimes Holy Thursday is referred to as Maundy Thursday. Typically that's more in the Protestant world than it is in the Catholic world. You might drive past some of our Protestant churches in the area and they say, like, Maundy Thursday celebrations and stuff like that. Which is curious because, generally speaking, it's not a totally fair statement, but Protestants don't like Latin because Latin is associated with Catholicism. And yet Maundy Thursday, the, the phrase, actually comes from the Latin word mandatum, right? Um, which means commandment, right? And remember, the, the, the washing of the feet is just simply Jesus saying, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you, right? It's a, a, a powerful exercise in remembering and reminding ourselves that no slave is greater than his master. And if this is what Jesus has done for us, again, going all the way down to be in service of us, I, I'm sorry, but that actually actually calls you to empty yourself of your pride, right? Think of how many times in our lives and in our world um, Something happens, well, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for them to say, help, to say they're sorry for me, right? I'm waiting, I'm waiting for them. I, I'm waiting for them to, to be the bigger person. Nope, sorry, actually, I hate to tell you this, I love you very much, but as a Catholic, you are always called to be the bigger person. Let me say that again. As a Catholic, you are how many times? Always, always called to be the bigger person. And why? Because that's exactly what Jesus says. Love one another, not as you want to, love one another how? As I have loved you, right? Is it inconvenient? Is it a pain in the butt? Do you sometimes wish it could be different? Sure, right? There are sometimes, I, some days that I wish I could just turn in my keys and be like, you know what? You guys run the parish. But no, you're always called to be the bigger person. Always. Always. You don't have the option not to be. Um, the Liturgy of the Word. Um, it's helpful, by the way, to pay attention during the Triduum services um, to the readings that we listen to during the Masses and the celebrations, right? Um, realize, one of the things I believe very deeply, and I believe it because the Church taught it to me, is, um, is a general rule of thumb that, uh, that the Church prays as she believes, right? The Church prays as she believes. In other words, the organization of our liturgies, the organization of what we say during Mass, what we hear during Mass, it's always meant to be an expression of, to us of what we actually believe. So pay attention. The readings for the Holy Thursday Mass, the readings for the Good Friday celebration, all of them are chosen with incredible intentionality, right? The reading for the, the first reading for the Holy Thursday Mass is the reading that explains the Passover ritual. Um, who can remind me of the Passover ritual? What am I talking about? What time frame are we in? Uh, sorry, Passover, what biblical time frame are we? Who's the hero in the book of Exodus? 
Yeah, that's right. Moses, right? Remember, the Passover was the last thing that Moses did before the Pharaoh finally let his people go, right? Um, and the Passover was this, uh, this elaborate ceremony that God would give to eventually spare God's people from the, the last plague over the firstborn, right? It says that you're supposed to take a one-year-old lamb, unblemished, right? Um, and you're going to slaughter that lamb and smear the blood of the lamb on the lintels, on the doorposts of your home. So that that night when the angel of death pa- <clears throat> excuse me, passes through Egypt, he'll pass over each of the houses of his chosen people, of the Jewish people, and he'll only take the lives, he'll spare the lives of the Jewish children, taking the lives only of the, uh, of the Egyptians, right? And in doing so, that ultimately is the thing that finally convinces Pharaoh, you know what, get out of here, right? But one of the phrases in the Passover liturgy, um, God says, you'll keep this day as an everlasting memorial. Oh, we said the word memorial earlier. Do you remember that? Right? And when I said memorial, I said the way that Catholics and the way that Jews see a memorial is not just an anniversary, like every year we're going to celebrate the Passover, think about all the things that God did, right? No. No. The way that we celebrate memorials as Catholics, the way that the Jewish people celebrated memorials, was it was taking the action of what God did in the past and making it present now. In fact, even to this day, our Jewish brothers and sisters, when they gather together for their Passover seders, and they say, why is this night different from every other night? And then the father of the family begins to recount exactly what God did for his people on this night that he He led them out of Egypt. He walked them through the waters of the Red Sea, led them into the the freedom of the sons and daughters of God. When they do that, they're not just imagining, oh, God did that 2,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago for his people. No, they're imagining God is doing that for me now, at this time. And again, it's the precursor for the Eucharist. Because I don't know if you ever paid attention, but what do we call Jesus in the, in the context of the liturgy. I always say, behold the Lamb of God, right? Because the fact is, Jesus is the unblemished, perfect sacrifice, the only begotten Son of the Father, who, yes, will be slaughtered for us and for our salvation. The blood of the perfect sacrifice of the Lamb of God will be smeared not upon the, the wooden doorposts of your home, but upon the the wood of the cross that he carried upon himself, right? Becoming both the the priest, the one who offers the sacrifice, and the victim, the one who is sacrificed, right? And Jesus is going to update, so to speak, that Passover ritual. He's going to bring it into his own time. He takes bread and wine into his hands. And think about this for a second. Because what Jesus is doing at that time, again, Jesus knows what's going to happen, right? He takes bread and wine into his hands, pronounces the words of blessing, says, take this and eat it. This is my body. And what does he do with the bread? Breaks it, right? As a matter of fact, you could say that the Eucharist is Jesus's anticipation of everything that's going to happen to him at Calvary the next day, right? Right? Jesus is offering himself in a non-bloodied way for his disciples in fulfillment of what he's going to do the following day in a very bloodied way, right? Takes his own body into his hands and breaks it, freely offers it for you and for me. The other reading that we'll hear at the Holy Thursday Mass comes from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And in fact, um, as St. Paul says, look, this cup of blessing that we share, is it not a participation in the the blood of Christ Christ our Lord, the bread that we break, is it not a participation or a sharing, a memorial of the body of Christ that we share, right? And one of the things that's super cool about it is it's actually the earliest scripture account of the Eucharist, right? Realize, you and I are used to hearing about the Eucharist in the Gospels, right? The Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as he's talking about the Last Supper, and and we we hear that account given to us. But um, chronologically, the Gospels were actually written a little bit later in the history of Christianity, right? 
maybe around the year 60, 70 AD, something around that time frame, right? This is about 30-ish years after Jesus' death, right? Eyewitnesses were collecting stories as they're collecting stories. Eventually, those stories move from an oral sharing of the story to a written sharing by 30 or so years after Jesus' death. We've got some written accounts of exactly what happened, uh, testimony of what Jesus did. But realize St. Paul was converted to Christianity relatively early on, right? In the time post-resurrection, as he's on the road to Damascus, he has that vision all of a sudden of Jesus. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's knocked to the ground, knocked off his horse, right? He's knocked to the ground and he's blinded in that moment. And Jesus says, it's Jesus that you're persecuting, right? Saul goes on to become Paul, the great evangelist to the Gentiles, going all over the place, sharing the good news of Christ. And as he's doing so, Each church that he founds, so to speak, each place that he visits and establishes a Christian community there, as he moves on to another place, he writes them letters, right? So the letters of St. Paul are some of the earliest scriptural texts that we have as Christians. Um, And so as St. Paul is going and he leaves Corinth and he writes back to the Corinthians and says, oh, by the way, this bread that we share, it's a participation in the, the death of Christ. And this wine that we share, isn't it a communion with the blood of Christ? It's the earliest account that we have of the Eucharist, right? And we're going to listen to that on Thursday night before we, we listen to the gospel about the commandment of Jesus' love, uh, Jesus' commandment to love one another. Other thing I wanted to point out to you, <clears throat> excuse me. So I uh, wanted to remind you again that uh, the, the Holy Thursday celebration not only commemorates the institution of the Eucharist, um, which we've already talked about, but it also commemorates the institution of the priesthood, right? How does God give us the Eucharist, but through his apostles? Um, And this great gift of the laying on of hands, right? The apostles, uh, remember, as they're going around and proclaiming the gospel, they'll lay hands upon other men who will be um, set up as, as overseers in these Christian communities, and then they'll lay hands upon other men and lay hands upon other men, and that gift, that grace that's been given at the time of the Eucharist is passed on to all of the different generations, um, including and up to today, right? Um, I do a little shameless self-promotion for a moment, but um, one of the things that I I think is really significant to know as Catholics, because I think, naturally speaking, like, we want to show our priests our gratitude for the gift um, of their lives and their service that they give to us, right? Um, And it's funny, oftentimes, when people try to, to be very um, uh, appreciative, one of the days that they pick to do so is usually Father's Day. <laughs> you call me father, I am your spiritual father, you just think amongst the other things, like, yes, I'll say Happy Father's Day to my dad, and then on my way out from Mass, I'll say Happy Father's Day to Father Bobby, right, or to Father Alice. And that's all nice and good, and you can keep doing that, that's not a problem, right? But let me tell you, the day that's most significant for priests, the day that's the origin story of priesthood, so to speak, is Holy Thursday, right? You want a way to to tell your priests that you appreciate them, that you love them, or you're praying for them? Pray for us on Holy Thursday, right? It's one of the reasons, by the way, you might have heard me mention at Masses, that Father um, Valdemar and Bishop Lombardo are calling us over to St. Mary of Chestahova on Holy Thursday morning. It's a chance to come together and to pray for our priests, right? A moment of gratitude for their service, a moment of gratitude for their sacrifice, and the opportunity just to continue to grow um, in love and in friendship. So um, join us for that if you can, right? But one of the the cool things that you can do um, to to show your priests that you care about them is show up for Mass on Holy Thursday night, right? If this place can be totally, totally packed on Holy Thursday, which I believe it will be, But if it can be totally, totally packed, um, that's something that lifts my heart up as a priest more than anything else, right? There are two dates that are important for priests, right? Two that you should kind of keep in in your mind if you're trying to say like, hey, I like you guys, right? One of them is Holy Thursday, and the other one is to memorize their priestly ordination anniversary, right? The day that they became priests. If you can kind of make a little mental note of that, those are two days that are are, are helpful to just kind of say like, hey, we care about you. Thanks. It's nice that you gave up your life for us. Like, we're happy about that, right? Thanks. So, um, Father Alex's priesthood anniversary is July 20th. Um, 
So don't forget that. July 20th. Put a little note on your calendar. Father Alex has been ordained 27 years. Is that right? You will be 27? Yeah. 27 years. And mine is May 12th, 2012. May 12th. So, and I'm coming up on 12 years. So that's one of those, like, what do they call those, like, golden anniversaries or something like that, right? So, um, so you can pray for me, right? One of the things that's so significant, though, remember that the, the theology of the church and also the, the gift that's been given is why do we appreciate priests so much? Because, and this is, please, don't, don't hear this as something that's, that's me saying, oh, look at how important that I am. I'm in total awe and humbled by this gift every single day, right? But realize, when the priest stands at the altar and when he celebrates the sacred mysteries on your behalf, so that the, the, the salvific action of Christ actually is applied to you and takes root in your life. The priest is acting in what we, excuse me, in what we call in persona Christi. In persona Christi just means in the very person of Christ, right? In other words, when I'm standing there and I say, take this all of you and eat of it, this is my body. It's not me talking at that point, right? It's not me giving you my body, right? The priest at the moment of the consecration is speaking with the very voice of Christ. In some ways, I, I lend my voice to Jesus. I lend my hands to Jesus. I'm, I'm acting in the very person of Christ. I become another Christ for the moment so that you and I can, can receive the gift of salvation that God wants to give, right? Do I deserve that? Absolutely not, right? Is that crazy? Absolutely. But God does it because he loves you and he doesn't want to leave you orphaned he always wants to be with you and to give himself to you and he does it through the the work of priests right kind of interesting too um i may have shared this in the past um so there's a a, a catholic mystic from the 17 and 1800s called blessed anne catherine emmerich um, blessed anne catherine emmerich had all of these like visions of um Jesus and of the events of the Passion and of the events of, of Holy Week and stuff like that. Um, and understand, none of the stuff that's written by Anne Catherine, em Anne Catherine Emmerich is official church teaching, right? You can go on with the rest of your life and choose not to believe anything of what she says, and you're still a legitimate, valid Catholic, right? This is what we call private revelation. It's stuff that's meant to be spiritually nourishing to the church, it doesn't contradict anything in Revelation or in the scriptures, um, but at the same time, it's, it's, it, it doesn't, it's not the scriptures, right? The scriptures themselves are the scriptures. Um, and so we don't take it with the, with the same level of weight of authority, right? But Anne Catherine Emmerich has some really cool details in um, her revelations and in her uh, visions of what happened at Holy Week. Stuff like, for example, the chalice that Jesus used at the time of uh, the Last Supper, was actually a chalice, a family heirloom that was passed on, not to Jesus, but to one of the apostles and one of the other people that owned the upper room where Jesus is at. And the, the chalice was passed down all the way from the time of Melchizedek. Do you remember Melchizedek in the book of Genesis, um, to whom Abraham offered bread and wine as one of the first foreshadowings in the Eucharist, all the way where, back at the very beginning of the Bible. So the fact that this chalice might be the chalice of Melchizedek, now used in the moment of the Last Supper, tying Jesus' eternal priesthood to the first mention of priesthood in the very, very beginning of the Bible, I don't know, cool detail, right? Is it, is it scripture? No. Is it something you have to believe? No. But is it something that, if it's true, helps to nourish our faith? Absolutely, right? One of the other things that and Catherine Emmerich had is a vision of the Last Supper where before actually um, offering the Eucharist, Jesus officially ordains his apostles to become priests, right? She has a vision of him teaching them how to celebrate the Mass, what they're actually supposed to do in these rituals so that they can carry on the work of the Eucharist to the end of time, right? She has this uh, really cool vision of him teaching them how to make the chrism oil. The chrism oil is the oil that's used in so many of the sacraments and stuff like that. Has the vision of Jesus actually laying his hands upon their heads. Um, and then, of course, going on and celebrating the actual Eucharistic liturgy um, as part of the Last Supper, right? Um, again, 
Scriptural? No. Necessary to believe? Not really. But does it kind of help to, to fill out the story a little bit? And if it's true, is it beautiful? 100%, right? Um, again, private revelation doesn't have the same weight, but the woman is a canonized saint, and she's deeply, deeply in love with the, with the Lord and receives a ton and ton of consolation from him. So just some interesting stuff, right? A couple other things that are just some details about Holy Thursday, and then we'll jump on to Good Friday. So um, at the Holy Thursday Mass, uh, again, because the whole uh, idea is this love one another as I have loved you, this great call to charity, to, to, to perfect love, self-giving, self-offering love, the Holy Thursday collection, the, you know, when you pack the baskets and, and we all share from our, our own material resources, the Holy Thursday collection is always designated towards some specific charitable cause doesn't go to the parish, it goes to continue the, the good work of charity throughout the clerks, excuse me, the, the, the church's good work of charity. Um, this year, um, I'm actually going to split the Holy Co Thursday collection, and half of it is going to go to the missionaries of charity, Mother Teresa's sisters, and the other half is going to go to the Franciscans of the Eucharist, um, that's the, the group in West Humboldt Park that so many of our parish uh, parishioners are affiliated with, um, who are taking care of the poor on Chicago's west side. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Both of those will be beneficiaries of our Holy Thursday collection this year. Um, the hymn that's oftentimes sung is a beautiful, beautiful hymn, um, a traditional Latin Gregorian chant called Ubi Caritas, simply stating where charity and love are found, God is present there, right? Wherever love is found, God is present there. The Mass goes on very much as usual. One thing to note, though, so in addition to the washing of the feet, which happens right after the homily, imitating the Lord and his commandment, um, remember how I told you the bells go silent at the Gloria? Remember that? When do I normally use bells in the Mass? Do you remember? During the consecration, right? When the priest holds up the host, the bread, and the wine, now after it's been consecrated and becomes the body and blood of Jesus. And again, what's the point of bells? To tell you to what? To tell you pay attention, right? Um, because it can be easy to let your mind wander, let's be honest, sometimes during Mass, as the priest is praying the prayers on your behalf, right? Um, but when he holds up the, the consecrated host, the bells ring in order to say, yo, notice this, right? This is Jesus' body given for you. Notice this, right? Um, there's a, an unfamiliar sound that you're going to hear on Holy Thursday because, again, the bells go silent after the Gloria. And so I'll say, take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body given up for you. I'll hold up the host, and you'll hear. <laughs> and then I'll take the chalice, and I'll say, this is my blood given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me, and you'll hear. <laughs> and it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's meant to be for you, in some ways, stark, right? We're entering, we're moving into the place of the passion of the Lord. Jesus is, is going to die. He's going to give himself up for you, right? And so it's meant to be almost jarring, right? There's nothing beautiful about that. There's nothing consoling about that. It's not a sweet little ding a ling a ling a ling a ling ding a ling a ling a ling a ling. No, it's right. But I want you to hear that, to know that, right? Um, and it reminds you that you're moving into the place of the Lord's passion. The mass, as I mentioned, closes with a um, procession uh, carrying the body of our Lord to a, a separate altar right over here, we'll have it set up, um, that's meant to look like a garden, again, reminding you of Jesus entering into the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, one of the things that's powerful about the Garden of Gethsemane and the mystery, that mystery um, is just very simply, realize, in the Garden of Gethsemane, you might almost say that Jesus can consents to his entire passion in advance, right? Because he's there praying, um, praying to his Father, and he's kneeling there, you, you get the sense that he knows the weight of what he's going to carry tomorrow. 
As a matter of fact, I, okay, this is not technical language, but the word Gethsemane essentially translates to big honkin' rock, right? Because a Gethsemane, what it was, is it was the rock that was used in an oil press to crush the olives and to make oil, olive oil, out of it, right? And so the fact that Jesus himself is in this place preparing to be crushed, right? The, the, the weight of what's going on is so heavy, so intense. Remember, the scriptures tell us that he even begins to sweat blood, right? As he cries out to his father, Father, if it's, if it's possible to let this chalice pass by without my drinking it, but not my will, but yours be done. And I love that, not my will, but yours be done, because everything that he's going to live through tomorrow, he says yes to today. He knows what's going to happen. And he chooses to go forward through it anyway. That's Holy Thursday. Um, one of the songs that's sung as we make our way to the Garden of Repose is a, a beautiful chant called Pange Lingua Gloriosi. You might take some time tonight and listen to Pange Lingua, P-A-N-G-E, and then L-I-N-G-U-A, Pange Lingua. Just listen to a little bit of the, the translation of it. The word made, made flesh, by word he taketh, very bread his flesh to be. Man and wine, Christ to blood, partaketh. And if senses fail to see, faith alone the true heart taketh to behold the mystery. You know what's happening when you come for the Eucharist. Let's be real for a second, right? As Catholics, we're not dumb. We know that there's something different about this place, right? When you walk into a church, you don't feel an empty building you feel like somebody's here. And the reason somebody, we feel like somebody's here is because he is. He's there in the tabernacle, right? And you might not be able to see it. You might not be able to explain it. You might not be able to, 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 to experience it in this kind of scientific sort of austere way. But if the senses fail to see, faith alone the heart ta true heart taketh to behold the mystery. Let's jump into Good Friday. You know, it's something that you should know. Um, on Good Friday, uh, the church doesn't actually celebrate any sacraments on Good Friday, with the exception of reconciliation and anointing of the sick, the two sacraments that are associated with mercy, right? With Christ's infinite mercy for us. But other than that, like, we, 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 we won't. We refuse to baptize people on Friday, on Good Friday. We actually refuse to bury people on Good Friday, right? If, if you die this week and you wanted a Friday funeral, sorry, tough luck, right? Um, so don't die this week, right? Um, although I will say this, it always makes me laugh a lot when um, funerals are the most unexpected thing in your life, right? God forbid, it's not a, a pleasant thing. But man, once somebody dies, people can become so convinced that the funeral can only and always have to be this day. I'm like, dude, two days ago, you didn't even know you were doing this. Come on now. How is it going to only be this day, right? Um, but you cannot have your funeral on Good Friday or Holy Saturday. I'm sorry, you can't. So um, if you call the church at that point, we're going to tell you no, and you're not allowed to get ticked off at us, okay? But no sacraments are celebrated. Um, also, you'll notice when you come in here, the altar and the sanctuary is completely bare, right? We're going to get rid of every single decoration in this church. It is going to look so stark and so austere. Not actually this church. It's going to be over at St. Pius. But still, um, it's going to be so stark and so austere that it almost feels cold, right? Giving you something almost of the impression of the tomb, right? Um, the Good Friday service, by the way, is not a mass. Sometimes people say, Father, what time is Mass on Good Friday? We don't celebrate sacraments on Good Friday, right? So what time is Mass? We don't have Mass, sorry, right? But the service that we celebrate on Good Friday begins at 3 o'clock, and it's scheduled at 3 o'clock because 
three o'clock is considered the hour of mercy. That's the time that Jesus actually expired on the cross for us, right? Actually died for us. So that'll be three o'clock. Um, but the service itself is not mass. And what I mean by that is, notice, when you come for that day, there is no consecration. There's no time when I take the bread and the wine in my hands and say, take this, all of you eat it. This is my body. This is my blood, right? I don't do that on Good Friday. I'll lead you through a series of prayers. I'll walk you through all of the different things that are happening. We'll reflect on the word of God. We will receive communion, but even the communion that's received isn't stuff that I'm consecrating at that celebration. It's what I consecrated yesterday at Holy Thursday. Sorry, what, imagining we're Good Friday, right? It's what I consecrated the day before at Holy Thursday. So at Holy Thursday's Mass, I'm going to have tons and tons and tons of Eucharist. And then Good Friday, we'll just continue to use the, the hosts that were consecrated the day before. One of the things that's incredibly powerful is that the entrance procession on Good Friday happens in total silence, right? Um, I'll come into the church, I'll drop to my knees, and then ultimately I'm going to lie prostrate, meaning I'm just going to lie on my face like this. And again, if you can think on... And remember that basic structure of all of the Triduum celebrations. This kenosis, kenosis, self-emptying, humility, going all the way down. And so the priest comes to the, comes to the ground, realizing that we're like, we're all just a little bit greater than dirt, guys. I mean, we put the Son of God to death, right? How rotten, how miserable, how wicked, how pathetic are we? I can't show my face there. I go all the way down. The whole point of the Good Friday liturgy is to commemorate and to celebrate the Lord's passion. By the way, I, I think you all know this, but when I say the word passion in reference to Jesus, what I'm actually saying is Jesus is suffering and death. You know that, right? When I say the passion, we're talking about Jesus' suffering and death. I realize that in our world, we use the word passion in a very different way, right? But we use it within the Catholic sense to refer to Jesus' suffering and death not because he's passionate about us, but because the word passion comes from the Latin root for to suffer, right? Um, as a matter of fact, even in, in secular usage, when we talk about passion and passions, right? Those are the things that cause us to suffer a little bit, right? How I long, how I yearn to, to make a difference in this world. I've got a passion for making a difference in this world. Well, yeah, it's, it's a suffering for making a difference in this world, right? But we talk about it in reference to Jesus when we refer to his, his cross and his death. The uh, entire liturgy is meant to give you a, an orientation towards that, right? to pay attention and to notice the, the death of our Lord. And the first reading for the celebration is, is really powerful. It comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Now think about this for a second, right? Isaiah the prophet is writing 700 years before the, the coming of Jesus, right? So this is 700 years before Christ. And this is what he says. He says, There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned, avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurn, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. He was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Who's Isaiah talking about? 
I'll tell you, that's a pretty stark, jarring description of the God-man, Jesus, who's come to save us, right? The moment of his passion and his death, I'm telling you, there was nothing in him to draw you to him, nothing that was attractive about him, nothing that made you say, oh man, like that's the guy I want to follow. No, he was crushed for our offenses, bruised for our iniquities. By his stripes we're healed. He took upon himself the chastisement that makes us whole. Right? There was in him no stately bearing, nothing to, to make us want to be with him. But Isaiah's writing 700 years before Jesus. He's talking about the servant of the Lord, the suffering servant. But you can tell that Isaiah is making some kind of messianic prediction, right? That somehow, some way, the Messiah that's going to come, that one that's going to save us, that's what he's going to look like. And you almost get the sense, I read this recently, you almost get the sense that Isaiah might have actually had a vision of the passion. Don't you? You almost get a sense that Isaiah somehow, some way, must have had like some sort of vision or premonition of exactly what this is going to look like. But that's the first reading for the, the celebration on Good Friday. The second reading is the one I've already been quoting, right? That Christ though he was in the form of God, didn't deem equality with, some, with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking upon himself the form of a slave. He was obedient even to death, death on the cross. And because of this, God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name above every other name, so that at Jesus' name every knee must bend in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth. Every tongue confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. And as I said, the Good Friday liturgy just continues that kenosis movement of all of the Holy Week liturgies, right? It's just getting us lower and lower and lower and lower. You're going to read the story of the passion of Jesus according to St. John. John pays so much attention to this idea of Jesus's hour, right? Remember when Jesus is doing the miracle, his first miracle at the wedding of Cana, he says to his mother, woman, what is this to you and to me? My hour has not yet come, right? But John knows that the hour of Jesus is always referring to his suffering and death. And let me tell you, by the time we get to John chapter, I think it's 19, 18, 19, it's Jesus' hour. It's time. He's going to give himself completely for us, right? What's really interesting is John structures his gospel in such a way as to have the first 12 chapters to be referred to um, oftentimes by scripture scholars as the gospel of signs, right? The first 12 chapters are, are just pointing out these different miracle stories, these different signs that Jesus gives that he's actually the Messiah, right? And let's be honest, the signs are the fun ones. They're the things that we, we really want to see. We, we, you know, wow, he multiplied loaves and fishes to feed 5,000 people. And oh my gosh, did you see? He cured the blind man. He healed him of his sight. Dude, he rose Lazarus from the dead. Like, that's what he's doing, right? All of these amazing signs that only God himself can do. But it's interesting, John doesn't see those as the marks of what God is really desiring to do. The whole second half of the gospel, from John 13 onwards, oftentimes is called the gospel of glory. And what's so fascinating to me is because you and I think about glory and we think triumph. But the Christian mystery associates glory not with triumph, but with self-sacrificing love, with perfect sacrifice. And the gospel of glory begins with Jesus divesting himself of his robe and getting down on one foot, taking a towel and wrapping, himself, wrapping it around his waist and washing the feet of his apostles. Not doing something miraculous, not doing something mighty, but a humble act of service, emptying himself completely. And it continues in the passion narrative. It's handed over and handed over and handed over and ultimately expired. The um, reading of the gospel is followed by... Um, what are called the, the solemn intercessions or the general intercessions. Um, if you've been to Good Friday before, raise your hand if you've come to a Good Friday service before. You came last year or in previous years, right? 
One of the things that a lot of people notice about the Good Friday liturgy um, is over and over and over again, we'll go, let us kneel. Let us stand. Let us kneel. And you're like, what, are we doing like Catholic calisthenics or something? Let us stand, right? Exercise, like that's the goal of what's happening there. No, the, the solemn intercessions um, are actually a, a really powerful thing. Because you have to imagine this, right? Jesus' love is unfurled for us on the cross. His arms are stretched between heaven and earth, literally to embrace the whole world, right? And on Good Friday, you get this strong sense that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life, right? His arms are open wide to embrace all of humanity. And what's cool about the, uh, the way that the solemn intercessions are structured, so they, they, they show that. They kind of almost deliberately have this progression that moves from the, the very close and intimate, let's pray for the church, right? We'll pray for all of her followers. We'll pray for all of our leaders. We'll pray for those that have received this great gift of the mystery of Christ, right? But then we're going to pray for the Pope. We're going to pray for the, the faithful, for all of you that make up and are members of the church, right? Oh, and we're going to pray, pray for our catechumens, those people that are coming into the church and that are going to celebrate um, their baptism at the Easter vigil. They're getting closer to the, the church. And then we're going to pray, actually, for all Christians, right? We're going to pray for all of those people who share our faith in Christ together, right? Who profess Jesus as Lord. And then, actually, we're going to pray for our Jew, Jewish brothers and sisters, those who are our spiritual siblings in the faith, right? Opening ourselves even more. They were the ones to whom God first revealed the covenant. They taught us and they gave us the Redeemer. And then we're going to pray, actually, for anybody in other religions, those who at least have a sense somewhere, some way in their hearts that God exists and he wants them to be in love with him, right? And maybe they're, they're looking for him, they're stumbling upon him in their own ways, but we want them to be associated with the, the work of the redemption as well. And then actually, we're going to pray for all of those who are atheists, agnostics, who maybe don't know the Lord, who can't quite understand God, but at least are trying to follow the light of truth in their own hearts, in their consciences, and trying to be good people and do what God desires for them. And then actually, <laughs> we're going to pray for the politicians. All of the liars. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We do pray for the politicians, but it's as a way of praying for the, 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 the whole world, right? Those who are leading the world and what have you. But again, do you, do you notice this kind of progression, what's going on, right? It's, again, it's, it's Christ unfurling his arms on the cross, stretching out his arms between heaven and earth to embrace all of humanity, right? I want them all to be mine, Father. I don't want to lose anything of what you've given to me, but I want to raise it up on the last day. The, um, after the solemn intercessions, we have what's oftentimes the most moving part of the liturgy. It's the veneration of the wood of the cross, right? And I'll take a veiled cross and bring it into the church and slowly but surely begin to unveil it. And I'll sing, Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us adore him. And then you and I will have the opportunity to come and just in this simple gesture of reverence, either with a kiss or, or just simply a touch, to, to tangibly feel the wood of the cross, right? To know that upon this wood hung your salvation, right? That you and I were lost, we were separated from God, we couldn't find our way back to him, and so he gave everything so that we could come and find you and bring you back. Would you come forward in, a, again, a simple gesture of love? Would you kiss the wood of the cross? Would you touch the wood of the cross? Would you make the sign of the cross? You might genuflect before the wood of the cross as a way of, of, of physically getting into your body. We're sacramental people. Physically getting into your body the power of Christ's passion and death. The service concludes, again, with communion. Again, as I mentioned before, the communion is um, what was given the day before. Oh, I mentioned, forgot to mention one detail. I love this. The, um, so uh, when, when we uh, look at the way to celebrate these liturgies, um, the church gives us pretty, pretty thorough instructions in there, right? 
and the instructions are oftentimes written in red. They're called the rubrics, right? And there's a, a curious line in the rubrics that um, refers to the, uh, to the veneration of the cross. It says, the priest is invited to come forward first to venerate the wood of the cross. And it says, he removes his shoes and then he comes forward to venerate the wood of the cross. And I don't know if you remember, but um, when Moses comes into the presence of God at the burning bush, the first thing that God says to Moses is what? Take off your sandals. You're on, you're on holy ground, right? And I think there's no ground more holy than the ground of Mount Calvary, where Jesus offers his entire life so that we can live an everlasting life with him. So as the priest comes to venerate the wood of the cross, on your behalf, so to speak, he takes off his shoes, recognizing that we're here on holy ground. During that time, there's actually a, a pretty haunting text that um, we oftentimes don't actually sing because um, it's really long and it's complicated and there's not a lot of good musical settings of it. Um, but it's worth your time at some point to look up online the Good Friday reproaches, um, just to read the text itself. If you get a chance sometime before Friday, look up the Good Friday reproaches. Reproach, you mean, it means to like, to shake your fist at someone, right? Um, it's heartbreaking. It's, it's written from the perspective of God looking upon his people. It's an ancient text that goes all the way back to the second century. starts out with God speaking to us, saying, My people, what have I done to you? Or how have I grieved you? Answer me. And he'll go on to talk about all of the mighty things that God did for us, and that instead of repaying him with our love, we repaid him with the cross. He says, Because I led you out of the land of Egypt, you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Because I led you out through the desert 40 years and fed you with miraculous manna and brought you into a land of plenty, you prepared a cross for your Savior. What more should I have done for you and have not done? Indeed, I planted you at my most beautiful choicest vineyard, and you have turned very bitter for me. For in my thirst you gave me vinegar to drink, and with a lance you pierced your Savior's side. I scoured, excuse me, I scourged Egypt for your sake, and with it, its firstborn sons, and yet you scourged me and handed me over. My people, what have I done to you, or how have I grieved you? And it goes on. It's, it's a very, very long text, but it's a very beautiful and haunting text. The uh, service concludes with receiving Holy Communion, um, being fortified and nourished by the Lord's gift of love. Um, but remember, as I mentioned, the communion isn't consecrated there. It was consecrated the night before. And then there's a final prayer and a final blessing, and the church departs in silence. We feel very deeply the effects of our sin and the love of the Savior of the world. I'm going to ask you to maybe just take a two-minute stretch break. Stand up, turn towards the person next to you, ask how their day is going.
God is good. All right, I only got one more day to give you. Have a seat. And I'm doing decent time-wise. We're probably going to hit it more or less what I said, so. Not too bad. I didn't start right at 7. All right, so. Uh, this is the little rubric that's given to us uh, on Holy Saturday. Um, and it's interesting. So Holy Saturday actually has two major parts to it in some ways, right? It has the day of Holy Saturday, right? Um, which realize if the passion service concludes with the death of Jesus, where is Jesus placed at the end of the passion service? He's in the tomb, right? So spiritually, you're entering into the tomb with Jesus, right? And although it's not technically part of the church's liturgy and, and, and proper, and the, the great three days triduum stuff, that tenebrae service that we do on Holy Thursday night, that service of darkness, excuse me, Good Friday night, that service of darkness that we do at 9 p.m., that's meant to almost help you to experience or to get into your bones what it's like to enter into the tomb with Jesus. It's a, a very powerful and a very haunting prayer service as well. Um, I oftentimes will recommend, if you can, come to the 3 o'clock service of the Lord's Passion, that's what I just described for you, and then come back again later that night at 9 p.m. for the Tenebrae service. So um, I think doing both of those is actually really moving for you. Um, but Holy Saturday, the day itself, the Lord is dead in the tomb, right? That's Jesus' time to, to, to be dead. Um, the... Uh, the rubric says, on Holy Saturday, the church waits at the Lord's tomb in prayer and fasting, meditating on his passion and death, and on his descent into hell, awaiting his resurrection. The church abstains from the sacrifice of the Mass, with the sacred table left bare, until the solemn vigil, that is, the anticipation by night of the resurrection, when the time comes for paschal joys, the abundance of which overflows to occupy 50 days. Right? By the way, when we say Paschal in the church, when we say the Paschal mystery, or when we say the Paschal candle, when we say Paschal in general, um, the word in your mind should just associate with Easter, right? Everywhere you hear Paschal, you could probably replace it with the word Easter. That's actually easier in Spanish because you have the word Pascua, right? And so if I say something as Pascual, you know that it has to do with what? With Pascua, right? So um, it has to do with Easter. So, uh, in English, the, the word connection doesn't happen quite as easily. Uh, but yeah, so Holy Saturday during the day is actually, it's meant to feel very solemn, meant to feel very empty. The fact is, actually, remember how I told you earlier that you know the difference? You walk into a Catholic church, the, 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 there's a presence here. You could feel like the church has somebody at it because Jesus is always there. He's in the tabernacle, right? The fact is, after the Holy Thursday Mass, and after the Lord is placed into the altar of repose, from that point forward, the Blessed Sacrament is removed from the church. You'll see that tabernacle wide open, the candle will be extinguished, you'll feel, and, and, and you'll actually feel like you walked into a place that's empty instead of a place that's full. So come here on Holy Saturday. Actually, Holy Saturday morning, um, we take advantage of that time, and in order to wait for the Lord in his, in, in his death and in the tomb, we take advantage of the time to prepare this place for the return of the Lord. And so we do a lot of spring cleaning, and we come back and we, we scrub the place from top to bottom and all around and, and make sure that the, like I say, it sparkles almost as a bride receiving her bridegroom, waiting for her bridegroom, right? Um, you remember your wedding day, some of you? Most of you, I hope, if you're, <laughs> if you're, if you're married, that is, right? Um, what do you do on the morning of your wedding day? You shower, thank you, yes, please, right? No, it's all about getting ready, right? You want to, and that time is a very busy time because you're doing your shower, your makeup, your dress, all the other kind of stuff, and your hair, and I don't have to do much of that, but, um, you know, all of that, that's the, the point of the, uh, uh, of the, the preparation time. So Holy Saturday, um, if you can, Please, give us a couple volunteer hours. We really need you on Holy Saturday. Nine o'clock to noon, basically, is what we're going to be doing um, as we're wandering around and cleaning things up. So um, bring a bucket, bring a rag, bring a mop, bring, uh, bring cleaning supplies, bring what? 
a rake, bring a rake if you can, because we'll clean up the outside areas as well. Um, but we, we definitely can use your help. So if you'd like to join us at 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, because that night, we have the great Easter vigil. And I'll tell you, the Easter vigil is the most radiant, magnificent celebration you could ever possibly imagine, right? Now, the Easter vigil for us as Catholics is the first celebration of the Easter mysteries, right? Of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Um, and the reason that we celebrate it first at night, um, in some ways, so think about this for a second. I'm going to personify night for a minute, right? But the only actual witness to the resurrection, to the moment of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? The moment from when he passed from being a dead corpse in the tomb to being a living body breathing again, right? The only person that saw that was who? Was the night, right? There were no eyewitnesses to the very moment of resurrection, right? The apostles who all experienced the resurrection, their first indication that Jesus had risen from the dead was coming the next morning on Easter Sunday and seeing the empty tomb. The second experience of knowing that Jesus had risen from the dead was gathering together in the upper room, and all of a sudden Jesus makes his way in there, even though the doors are locked, shows up before them, breathes on them, and says, peace be with you, I'm giving you COVID. <laughs> Just kidding, right? But he says, peace be with you, and he gives them the Holy Spirit, right? Um, but that's Jesus' is. Uh, that's the first experience or encounter of the resurrection. Now, we know the resurrection happened, right? People don't come back alive if there wasn't a moment where they were brought back to life, right? But the fact is, the only person to actually see, experience the resurrection was the night and the darkness of the tomb. And so because of that, as Catholics, we celebrate Holy Saturday night passing into Easter Sunday as the great moment of, of announcing the Lord's resurrection. We join the night in being the witness of Christ's risen glory. Now, it's interesting because remember those rubrics I keep telling you about? The rubric for Holy Saturday always makes me laugh because the rubric for Holy Saturday says, the vigil mass should start sufficiently late so as to begin in darkness. Now, we'll be close enough to darkness, right? It'll be seven. Um, but should start sufficiently late so as to begin in darkness and should end sometime before sunrise the next morning. <laughs> now, I could talk a lot. <laughs> I could do a lot of teaching. And our Easter Vigil Mass is a lengthy mass, but I have never once accomplished one that went all the way until sunrise the next morning. I'm going to try it this year. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, but I have to tell you, now, pay attention, though, right? Why would the church even say something like that? The church would say something like that because this is meant to be our greatest celebration. For crying out loud, some of you guys get together for a birthday party, and your party starts a little bit after dark and doesn't end until sometime around 5 o'clock the next morning. So don't tell me it can't be done, right? But the fact is, this is meant to be our greatest celebration. As Catholics, Jesus rose from the dead! He's alive, right? Like, how do you not fill your heart with incredible, overwhelming joy such that the church says that that joy expands to occupy 50 full days, right? Like, that's the greatest announcement ever. Death isn't the end. Death doesn't have the last word. It's not victorious. Christ is victorious. And so we begin the Easter Vigil Mass with a candle. This is called the Paschal Candle, by the way. Now, this one is uh, quite a bit burned down because we blessed it last year at the Easter Vigil, right? Um, and we brought this one in. And the Paschal Candle is typically lit during any of the celebrations of baptism, so when new members are being brought into the church and are given that gift of eternal life that Jesus won for us. And it's also lit at funeral masses where as we're praying for a soul that's passed on from this life, we're reminding ourselves of the hope of eternal life that Jesus won for us. So the Paschal candle represents Christ and represents Christ's resurrected glory. And we begin the Mass actually not inside the church, but outside in the parking lot where the, the, 
uh, Easter fire will be prepared, and the fire is used to light the Paschal candle, right? And it's meant to remind us of the power of Christ's burning love for us. And so we go out there, and we prepare, and we pray, and we bless the fire, and then from there, we light the Paschal candle as a way of reminding us of Christ's glorious resurrection. And we enter into this church, which is basically pitch black, and we proclaim the light of Christ. And what I love about candles, realize this, right? It only takes one candle to scatter the darkness, right? It doesn't matter what building you're in. It doesn't matter what room you're in. If the room is pitch black and suddenly someone lights one flame, now it may not be enough to illuminate the darkness, but the darkness is no longer dark, right? Jesus says, excuse me, St. John says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it, right? Satan's power has nothing on us. Let me say that again. Satan's power has nothing on us because we've been saved by the precious blood of Jesus. And so we walk into this place with this candle and we proclaim the fact that darkness doesn't win, darkness doesn't have the last word. The light of Christ will reign in glory. And as we come into the church, all of you guys are actually carrying these little candles. Look at how cute they are, right? And you're carrying these guys, and you follow me and the, and the deacon in procession, and as we come into this place and we proclaim the light of Christ, what we start to do is we begin sharing this light with all of you, and now your candles start to, to spread the light of Christ to everybody else in the church as well. And so before you know it, this place that was basically pitch black is now fully illuminated with the light of Jesus Christ's glory coming from that empty tomb. I love it. The, the Easter Vigil Mass um, inside the church begins what, what's called the exultet. Can you say exultet? Exultet is just a, a Latin word. It's a command saying rejoice, exult, right? Exult means to overwhelmingly rejoice, right? Um, it's the most powerful kind of strongest form of the word rejoice, right? If I say exult, you're meant to boom, right? And the uh, priest gets in, comes in, and he sings the exult. It's a, it's a, a five or six minute long chant. Um, and again, ancient text goes back all the way to the time just after the apostles. Um, and it's the proclamation of the Easter mystery. It's the priest coming in and saying, this is what Jesus did. In this moment, this is what he accomplished. I sing, this is the night when Christ broke the prison bars of death and rose victorious from the underworld. Right? You can imagine Jesus showing up. I'm going to put this down for a second because I don't want to break it. Well, I've already broken it, but that's okay. Jesus walking in from a second. You understand, like, this is what Jesus does. He shows up. He comes down to hell. He breaks open pff, the doors of sin and death, and he goes and he grabs all of those souls and brings them up to everlasting and eternal life. Jesus is not going to leave you empty. He's always going to come and raise you up. And so this is the night when Christ broke the prison bars of death, rose victorious from the underworld. Oh, truly blessed night, worthy alone to know the time and hour when Christ rose from the underworld. Remember, nobody else saw this. The night itself was the only witness. This is the night of which it is written, the night shall be as bright as day, dazzling is the night for me, and full of gladness. Pope Francis, by the way, carrying the Paschal candle into St. Peter's Basilica. Um, one of the things that's so powerful about that Easter proclamation, the, the, the church has the gall, has the balls to say, oh, happy fault, oh, necessary sin of Adam, that won for us so great a redeemer. Think about that for a second. I'm telling you, that's, that's a ballsy statement, right? Oh, necessary fault, right? Remember, this is, we're proclaiming, exulting, we're rejoicing. Right? O oh, necessary fault. O oh, sin of Adam. Sorry, O oh, happy fault. O oh, necessary sin of Adam. That won for us so great a redeemer. Now think about this for a second. Because so many of you are so tempted to say, man, wouldn't it be nice if Adam never sinned? Like, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to deal with 
suffering and death and difficulty and challenges in our lives? Wouldn't it be nice if we were all just kind of robots and, you know, walking around all the time just being like, everything is awesome. Everything is cool when you're part of a team. Everything is awesome when you're living on a dream. Right? Wouldn't that be fun? Wouldn't that be so much better? Uh, I don't know if you've seen the Lego movie, but let me tell you. When they sing Everything is Awesome, can we be honest for a second? Everything's not actually awesome, right? When I think it's going to be all good, we think that, man, wouldn't it be nice if Adam had never sinned? But what God has done for us, in spite of or in the wake of Adam's sin, is so much more powerful, so much more meaningful, so much more significant, that we can say, oh, happy fall. We can call Adam's sin good, right? It's not actually good. You realize that you don't want to sin. That's not a good thing. But if Adam's sin is going to have won for us Christ, if that's what God's response to Adam's sin was, on some level, I'm going to say thank you. Thank you. Because what you've done in Christ is far more amazing than I could ever believe. Everything really is awesome. I love this because this is what I, uh, as I'm blessing the new Easter candle for the year, I inscribe it. Um, I inscribe it with the, the details and the date of the new year. Um, and this is what I say as I'm inscribing it. And I, I, again, I just think it's the most powerful proclamation of victory, right? That Satan thought that he could trap us in sin and death, and that idiot was so foolish that he thought he could destroy God forever, and God bursts forth and kicks him in the face. And so I say, Christ, yesterday and today, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. All time belongs to him and all the ages. To him be glory and power through every age forever. Amen. By his holy and glorious wounds, may Christ the Lord guard us and protect us. Uh, let's see. I already said that about that. Uh, the whole Easter vigil. So, again, realize, I'm going to give you a little, uh, I, I'm going to let you in on a piece of news. The Easter vigil is a long one. All right, smile at me. Say, it's okay, Father. And say, we're here because we want to be. Right? We, we love Jesus. I, I'm going to tell you this, though, right? The Easter Vigil is meant for people who are in love, right? Because when you're in love, there is no time, right? When you're sitting at dinner with a, a girl that you're trying to date, or a guy that you're trying to date, right? Trying to court or something like that, and you're sitting at dinner and you're having a really rich and a beautiful conversation, let me ask you, is anybody looking at the clock being like, man, I wish this would end soon? <laughs> anybody? Because let me tell you, you're not getting a second date if that's what you're doing, right? <laughs> Man, I, I can't wait for this to be over. Can we, can we go home yet, right? No, like, you're so absorbed by the power and the glory of what's going on. You don't care about time. And so I'm just going to be real with you. I don't care about time on the Easter Vigil. I don't, right? I don't care if you're here two hours or three hours, or I don't care if we start after dark and we don't finish until sunrise. Because I don't care about time. We're in love with Jesus. And we're here, and we're doing what he wants us to do. And again, remember this idea of memorial, right? Because if all of this stuff is a memorial, as we proclaim the different readings throughout the course of the Easter Vigil, as we call to mind the covenant that God has made with his people, starting with creation, strengthened in Abraham and his commitment and his fidelity to the Father, looking at Jesus, uh, excuse me, Moses leading his people into freedom, power, uh, the powerful testimony of Isaiah and the other prophets, as we're looking at the way that God has constantly stood beside his people, I'm not tired of that, right? And I'm not going to skimp on it. I'm going to give you all of the readings that the church has to offer, 
so that you hear that. The whole thing is a, a, a song. It's singing the life pouring out in abundance because Easter is a season of new life. Um, there's seven readings. There's seven psalms. Um, and that's kind of a cool thing, actually, because as you're at the, the Easter Vigil Mass, we're going from reading to reading to reading to reading to reading. You're listening to some of the richest scriptures that the, the church has to offer, right? But remember, seven is the perfect number. And seven also represents and parallels and corresponds with the seven days of, of creation, right? The seven days of creation that it took God to create the world. But what's cool is in the scriptures... The way that we understand the number of seven is the number of completion, right? The number of perfection. But the way that we understand the number eight is the number of new beginnings or new creation, right? Fulfillment uh, of lifting up that which God had already made. And so it's really powerful because, yes, we got the seven readings to parallel the, uh, the, the seven days of creation and God's covenant that's made with his people. But then as soon as we finish those, we stand we sing the Gloria again. The bells are unleashed. We enter into the New Testament. And as we enter into the New Testament, we listen to Paul so powerfully stating that Christ has risen for us and then proclaim the Easter gospel. Um, it's like the eighth day. Easter is the day of new life and new beginnings. Easter Vigil always has a reference to the uh, Exodus reading. Exodus reading, again, remember, is uh, Moses parting the Red Seas, bringing his people on uh, from slavery and, uh, into freedom on dry land. Um, and it's uh, meant to be a spot to, to remind us of our own Passover. God's bringing us from slavery to freedom because Christ is fulfilling the work of Exodus by delivering us from slavery to our sins and giving us a gift of new life. The whole liturgy of the word, all seven of those readings, um, expose something of a deep longing that each of us has for the fullness of life that only God can give. Um, and it's beautiful because the, uh, the majority of people that are going to be here are in some ways affiliated with those members of our community who are seeking the sacraments of initiation, seeking to be baptized, receive First Holy Communion and Confirmation, right? These are adult candidates, people who have lived some of their lives and have said, no, my life belongs to Christ. I'm making a decision for the Lord. I want him above everything else. What he has to offer, I can't live without. And it's really beautiful because when we have a baptism at the Easter Vigil, um, the church substitutes in one of the Psalms so that we sing Psalm 42 as the deer that longs for running water. My soul yearns for you, my God, right? You'll hear that from the choir singing that beautiful psalm, reminding us exactly of, of what our souls really are made for. We'll, um, just before the gospel, we'll sing that word that we've hidden away for the last six weeks. Um, that word that starts with an A and rhymes with Maumeluya, <laughs> right? Um, and I'm not going to say it now, because if I say it now, then it's like, well, we'll only wait for six weeks to say it, right? But I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to be excited, and I'm going to sing, Mame Muya, Mame Muma, Mame Muma. And you'll all go to, the, your hearts are going to burst forth with that joy, and you're going to also go, Mame Muya, Mame Muma, Mame Muma, right? And we do that because, again, that word is that overwhelming sort of bursting forth of praise that comes from the heart and is absolutely, totally transfixed on what God has given to us. It's the glorious announcement of the gospel of the resurrection. You know, what's so beautiful is um, after the, 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 the liturgy of the word, after all of those readings, after the homily, after I've shared with you the, the Easter joy, right? The church makes it concrete, and we offer to those members of our community that are seeking baptism and confirmation, we offer them the gifts of new life, and we follow the, the liturgy of the word with the liturgy of baptism, right? Um, why does that happen? Because realize, again, if, if all of this stuff is a memorial of what God has done for us, if he's making it present for us now, here and now, and to, in this very day, there's no way that God does it more effectively than through the sacrament of baptism. Your soul is changed, it's transformed, it's reconfigured because of the gift of baptism. You're no longer living for you, you're living for God, right? You become dead to yourself. 
As a matter of fact, baptism is sort of beautifully a mystery of death and a mystery of life, right? You and I think about baptism, especially when we baptize babies, and we're like, oh, isn't this cute? Like, look at my little baby in her baptismal dress. Oh, this is so sweet. And we're going to pour some water on her head. And we're going to baptize her in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> oh, fun, right? Realize, no, the scriptures, St. Paul, sees baptism not as a mystery of life, but first as a mystery of death, right? Baptismal waters not only cleanse, they also drown, right? They take your old self, yourself that was born to sin, and they destroy it so that you can be given the gift of new life, right? As a matter of fact, if, if I had it my way, I kind of do, right? But baptism should look more like this, right? I grab your head, and I go... I baptize you in the name of the Father. <laughs> and of the Son. <laughs> and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I think I would probably be arrested if I did that to the babies. But, <laughs> but that's the image that you're supposed to have of baptism, right? That you are dying to your old self. You're surrendering your old self. You've given yourself away to God, right? In fact, if I can say this really, really bluntly, if baptism is actually a mystery associated with death before it's a, a mystery associated with new life, for those of us who are baptized, our baptism was the death that really mattered. Say that again. For those of us who are baptized, our baptism was the death that really mattered. Because when you actually die, physically, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, whatever it is, that's part of passage, right? That's moving from this state of life to that state of life, right? Baptism was the death that really mattered because that's what changed you. It took you from being a person destined for hell, separation from God for all of eternity, and put you decidedly on the side of life, living with God for all of eternity, right? It took you from being a creature of God to becoming a beloved son or daughter of God, right? Through baptism, God gives you all of the inheritance of his kingdom, that you belong to him now, right? A priest friend of mine said once, if you die before you die, when you die, you will not die. I think that's the most beautiful statement I've ever heard. If you die before you die, if you die through baptism, before you actually physically die, then when you die, you will not die. Profound. Profound. And so that's the reason, understand, that the church celebrates baptism in conjunction with these Easter mysteries, right? Because what baptism is doing is it's reminding us that Christ's life actually raises us. It's beautiful because as we um, invite those candidates, and we have one person receiving baptism this year, as we invite those candidates into the sacrament of baptism, what we'll do is we'll process to the baptismal font, we'll carry this candle again, because this candle represents what? It represents Jesus, right, and his resurrection. We'll carry this candle back to the baptismal font. Meanwhile, the whole church is going to be singing the litany of the saints, right? Calling upon all of God's family in heaven, all of those people who have received this gift of everlasting life, to pray for us at this moment, because the person that's going to be baptized is literally going to die, right? And so we have to pray for her in this moment, because it's an intense moment. Right? And she's going to receive all of the infinite perfect grace of God. And so we walk to the back of the church, we sing the litany of the saints, we ask all of them to pray for us and to pray for her, so that what I have to do, which is to kill her, that I can do well, so that she receives the gift of everlasting life. You understand that, right? Good. So I get to the back of the church. We'll, uh, uh, I'll pray a prayer of blessing over the baptismal waters. And again, what's powerful about the prayer of baptism, uh, the blessing over the baptismal waters, um, look what it says. It says, May the power of the Holy Spirit, O Lord, we pray, come down through your Son into the fullness of this font, so that all who have been buried with Christ by baptism into death 
might rise again to life with him. And as I do that, I dip the Paschal candle into the baptismal waters, right? You think of it almost as, a, as an act of giving new life into those waters, right? And pouring the life of Christ into those waters. Essentially what we're saying is, God, take and send your Holy Spirit here so that these very baptismal waters have the power to do what you've promised it's going to do, which is to give this person new and everlasting life. You're all still stuck on the fact that I'm going to kill her on Saturday, huh? <laughs> That's what I want, right? I ask her to make promises, baptismal promises, to reject sin and to reject Satan, to turn away from evil, right? It's actually kind of cool because in the ancient church, you used to always face the West during the time that you were rejecting Satan, right? You used to face the West and you'd say, I reject Satan, I reject sin, I reject evil, I reject to be mastered by sin. And as a, a physical manifestation of the turning of your life around, you would turn and face the East and make your baptismal promises towards the rising sun that new life, that new day that was given, and you'd say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. My life doesn't belong to this anymore. My life belongs to this. I'm living for him. That's all I want. That's all I need. That's all I'm going to give, right? And the church expects demands from you that kind of profession of faith. And listen carefully, friends, because this is where I think we go wrong often in our lives, right? Because in a few moments uh, in that Mass, you're going to also renew your baptismal promises, which, let's be honest, you've done every year at Easter for every year of your life, right? But the problem is oftentimes this is how we turn away from sin. And that's not good enough. It's not good enough. And I, I'm sorry to say it so bluntly, right? But who does your life belong to? Because from the moment I was baptized, that's the death that really matters. I don't live for this anymore. And I know some of you are going to say, but Father, I was baptized as a baby. I didn't make that choice. Good, but you're making that choice now. <laughs> right? Like, at some point, own the choice that was made. Right? But Father, I was forced to go to school as a child, so I had to learn how to read. Well, that's nice. Guess what? Good thing you had to learn how to read. Thank your parents for that, right? I'm glad they sent you to school. I'm glad they forced you to go. And I don't think it's inappropriate for them to force you to be receiving the incredible, powerful, merciful gift of God's love. Stop whining about it and own it. And turn and live for him, right? We aren't playing games anymore. I want one of those baptismal fonts, by the way. So um, next, time, next time one of you gets $60,000, which is about what it would cost, that's, I want to put it right there in the front over there at the entrance of the church, yeah. So um, if anybody is feeling just being extra generous tomorrow or this week, um, Holy Thursday, as you want to <laughs> celebrate your priest, you can just write me a check, not me, you could write it to Blessed Miguel Pro, but write a check for $60,000 and we'll put it in a new baptismal font and I'll put your name on it. Right? Don't you think that'd be cute? Because then I really could be. I baptize you in the name of the Father. <laughs> Just a couple more things and we'll be ready to go. Um, so, after we witness our new members receiving the gift of baptism, right, as we've experienced that and walked in it with them, Part of the joy is, I, I hope that in your heart, there's that like yearning, that longing, like, I want that. And I'm going to be like, well, guess what? You had that. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to renew your baptismal promises. And it's super beautiful because what happens is she's going to go through and she's going to relight all of those little candles that you have in your hands that you brought in at the beginning of Mass. And she's going to relight them because you'll remind yourself of the baptismal candle that you were given at the moment that you were baptized, even if you were too young to remember it, right? And holding that little light in your hand, you'll be able to say, I 
also reject sin and Satan and all of his empty promises. And I also want to live for God, believe in God the Father Almighty. And it's beautiful because those questions, those promises, are phrased literally like vows, right? Do you reject Satan? I do, right? And all of his works, I do, right? Literally like wedding vows, because guess what? That's exactly what the Christian mystery is. God loves you so much, he desires to marry you. He's joined himself to you permanently. The word became flesh. He entered into your life. He's united himself to you. I do, I do, I do. And then I get to do my favorite part. Just come through with the holy water and soak you. Because you'll, you realize that's the whole point of holy water, right? It's not just some tool for me to be annoying. Um, Holy water is meant to remind you of your baptism. It's rem that, that's the day, that's the most important day of your life when you were brought to that baptismal font. It's the day that really counts. And the holy water is meant to remind you of that. It's meant to, to call that back to your memory. And so every time you walk into a church, what do you do? You dip your hand in, holy water. Every time that Father Bobby gets a hold of the bucket, what does he do? Sprinkles you with, or soaks you with, holy water, right? Um, the neophytes, which are the people that we uh, call the newly baptized, right? Uh, neo just means new, right? The, the newly baptized, the neophytes, are immediately then anointed with the sacred chrism. They're confirmed into the church. Um, that, along with many of the other adult candidates, who will be confirmed as well. Um, remember, the gift of confirmation is meant to strengthen your baptismal promises for the sake of living out your mission in the world, right? That God has a plan, he has a vocation for you, he wants to give you that vocation, and instead of having an immature faith that isn't capable of living that, uh, that, uh, that uh, plan that God has, you're meant to strengthen that faith and receive supernatural grace to begin to live it out more perfectly. And that's what confirmation does, right? Um, I s seal you with sacred chrism. Um, I'm going to walk around for a moment with the chrism oil. And the chrism oil is meant to be fragrant and radiant. It's supposed to give you the sense that... Um, actually, Lucy, do you want to walk around with the chrism oil? So I can be talking. Um, but smell the chrism as she brings it past you, right? Um, but the chrism oil is actually... It's meant to be fragrant, it's meant to be radiant, because your gift of yourself and your gift of your vocation of following Christ is meant to radiate and to, to touch every corner of the world. Fragrances and odors, notice how they fill a room really easily when, um, when, they're, when they're good ones. I guess when they're bad ones too, right? If you fart or something like that, that also fills the room. Um, so be a good fragrance, not a bad fragrance, right? Um, live your vocation well. Um, but the sacrament of confirmation is meant to help you to become the saint that you're called to be, right? To put into practice the gifts of, uh, the gifts of your vocation that you've received. Um, kind of cool just to note that after the baptismal liturgy, we begin the liturgy of the Eucharist. If you remember, it said in the rubrics that the altar was left completely bare. Why? Because we have not yet come back to the table of the sacrifice, right? We haven't celebrated any sacraments. The altar is bare because up until this point, we're still in the tomb. And now that we've received the gift of new life, and now that we've seen Christ risen from the dead, we come back and we put into practice exactly what he's asked us to do. Do this in memory of me, right? Um, the neophytes themselves are the ones that actually dress the altar and prepare it for the celebration of the sacrifice. And we'll go forward with the, uh, the liturgy of the Eucharist, um, praying the, the prayers of consecration once again over the bread and the wine. One thing that's really beautiful is during the Eucharistic prayer at the Easter Vigil, we add the names of the newly baptized into the Eucharistic prayer. So we pray specifically for them because of the graces that they've received at that Mass. Um, communion is given in both species to our newly initiated, help more fully express their union with the Eucharistic sacrifice. And then the whole celebration concludes with a solemn dismissal, the joy of the resurrection, which explodes into the Paschal season with an eight-day octave and then 50 days of rejoicing. When I say eight-day octave, by the way, what I mean is we actually celebrate Easter as if it's one day that goes on for eight days, right? Um, you and I, oftentimes, we, in our own celebrations at home, we're like, Easter Sunday, yay, we all get together, and now let's take down all of our Easter de decorations and move on. The church doesn't move on. The church says this is the most important world-changing event that has ever happened in the history of mankind, and it's not, um, we, are, we, we have to celebrate it. We have to live our lives completely rooted.
Pretty cool, no? All right. Um, I think that's what I have. Let's pray. Um, those that have to head out, you're welcome to head out. Those that want to stay for a few moments just for question and answer, you're welcome to stick around. But uh, let's pray first. I'll give you a blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, the world without end. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Did you learn anything tonight? Yes. You feel like you got some good information? Good. So here's what you, uh, you can do for me. Two things that are important, right? One, um, so tomorrow, one thing I didn't talk about and didn't really mention, tomorrow we have a special Mass at Holy Name Cathedral called the Chrism Mass. It's the Mass where the Cardinal calls together all of his priests, and one of the things that we'll do is to bless all of the oils, the holy oils that will be used in the celebration of the sacraments throughout this next year. It's a beautiful Mass, and it's a powerful moment. It's also, at that Mass, my opportunity and Father Alex's opportunity to renew our priestly promises. So we do that in the presence of our bishop, the one who ordained us, right? Um, and so if you can just pray for Father Alex and for me tomorrow as we renew our commitment to serving the Lord and the Church, um, and as we bring back to our parish the holy oils that will be used in the celebration of the sacraments. Tomorrow we're going to make the chrism that's going to be used to anoint and confirm so many of the members of our parish community um, this coming Saturday. So um, please pray for that. And then the second thing, uh, you didn't come to a Holy Week 101 celeb uh, lecture to then skip the triduum. That would be a stupid thing to do. So your, your real place that you want to put this into practice is showing up on Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. So remember, Holy Thursday, the Mass begins here at 7 p.m. Um, here at St. Leonard. Good Friday, um, though there's a lot of options and a lot of things to do on Good Friday, I'd recommend it's all at St. Pius, the 3 o'clock service of the Lord's Passion, that's in English, or if you prefer to come to the Spanish one, we're going to repeat the same service at 6 o'clock in Spanish, okay? And then here, of course, on Holy Saturday night, the Great Easter Vigil, my favorite Mass of the entire year. It's going to be so fun. It's going to be so beautiful. So that's 7 o'clock on Holy Saturday night, okay? God bless you all. Um, anybody that wants to stick around for questions, feel free to move a little bit closer and we can do question and answer.